Julia Cameron, I'm so delighted that I get to have you back on the show. You have been such a instrumental part of my path. And I've, I just, uh, I don't know how to really put it into words. That's really something you're better at, but reading the artist way years ago and then reading it again and then following your work has made such a difference. So I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for coming back. Thank you. It's good to be back. So since you were here, you've been very busy creating even more amazing things. Um, you have a newest book, Right for Life. And before that, you had a book, Seeking Wisdom. And before that, you had The Listening Path. All of those things happened since you were on the show. I feel like for our audience, it's really nice to have context of you because some people haven't read The Artist's Way. It's hard to believe, but some people don't know anything about anything, which is a travesty. So I want to just give them a little bit of a background of who you are and why creativity is so important to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah. why don't you, why don't you share with us a little bit of why you feel like this is your work in the world to help people to find all of the beauty within themselves and express it? Well, I, I came upon it through experience. I was newly sober uh, and I was trying to write uh, and I was guided by my new friends to try and let the higher power write through me. And I said, what if he doesn't want to? And they said, well, just try it. So I started trying, okay, God, you take care of the quality, I'll take care of the quantity. Uh, and I found that I began to write freely. Uh, and I had a small group of friends who were all creative, and they were all blocked. Uh, and I had grown up in a big family where when you learned how to tie a shoe, you taught your sibling how to tie a shoe. Mm -hmm. So when I learned about writing more freely, I started teaching it to my little circle of friends. Uh, and from there, uh, it spread. Uh, it, it certainly did spread. And I love what you just said. It's such a beautiful description of the experience where you said, well, what if, what if God doesn't show up? Right? Like, I think that that is something that everyone has an experience of sometimes of maybe having the hope that something could come through, but not knowing how to create the conditions for that inspiration or that, that flow or whatever. And through so many different tools, like morning pages and so many other things, you've helped people find their way to the page. What would you say to somebody who is having that experience where they're still not able to, to, to find that the words come through? Well, first of all, I want to say um, I'm wearing eyeglasses um, because I had eye surgery. Uh, and so I feel like I look a little bit incognito. Uh, and I was worried uh, when I put them on. I thought if I have to teach, they're, they're not going to know who I am. Uh, and uh, I realized I de depended upon eye makeup. Uh, and um, so I think that when I'm talking to people, I just want to be sure that they have a light heart. Uh, and I think when people are blocked, they have a heavy heart. Uh, and when they're straining for creativity, uh, they are sort of trying to reach for something that they may not feel is there. That's so beautiful. It makes a lot of sense. And by the way, with your glasses on, you look extremely cool. So I thought that was just a creative choice to wear glasses. Um, in this newest book that just came out a couple of weeks ago, Right for Life, you talk about giving people practical tools to start. And I love what you just said about that, 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 that light heart versus a heavy heart. And um, I'm curious what you think 
because so often people will write to me and say, I'm not creative at all. I'm just not creative. And do you think that everybody has indeed uh, creativity in them? Or what do you say when people say to you, oh, you don't understand, like, I'm not a creative person? Well, I think that means they haven't scratched the surface. <laughs> uh, and I, my experience has been that all of us have a creative inner spark. Uh, and that as we contact that, we come to trust it. Uh, and as we trust it, we come to expand. Uh, and my tools are tools of expansion and hope. Uh, and I think uh, I recently had a, a critic say, Julia's tools are simple and repetitive. And I think it was supposed to be an insult. <laughs> and I was delighted. I said, tools should be simple and repetitive. That's right. So I think um, I think we can talk a little bit about the toolkit um, because I think uh, if people are listening and wondering, well, God damn it, she's written 40 books. She clearly has no problem with being blocked. Uh, and I want them to know that I had to devise tools which kept me unblocked. Uh, and the first tool is something called morning pages. Uh, and it's three pages of longhand morning writing about absolutely anything. And the pages are designed to help people find their authentic selves. Uh, and it's important to do them by hand because there's a direct connection between the heart and the hand. So uh, if somebody's blocked, the first thing I would say to them is, okay, get up in the morning and write three pages of longhand writing. And they say, well, why does it have to be in the morning? <laughs> and I say, well, <laughs> it has to be in the morning because that's laying out your trajectory for the day. Uh, and if you do them later in the day, you're reflecting on a day you've already had and you're powerless to change. So. That's so what? beautiful. I was just going to say when you, something happened that made me, my eyes welled up with tears when you, when you mentioned the morning pages, first of all, probably because I remember a time in my life where I was consistently doing it. But I think the real reason I felt all this emotion is because I think that most of the time myself and many, many people have the experience of not allowing ourselves to do anything unless we know the outcome or unless we feel like we have to get it right. And there's something so pure about giving yourself three pages without the need for any perfection or any goal, like just to simply allow yourself to write. And I just feel like that is so lost on most of us most of the time. And it's such a cathartic, loving thing to give yourself that grace and that time. What do you think about that need that people have to have the goal or the end in mind or perfection? And what do you think about how that gets in people's way? Well, I think perfectionism is a huge block for people. We judge our fledgling efforts against the masterpieces of great artists. And we say, if I can't do it perfectly, I don't want to do it at all. Yeah. Uh, and with the morning pages, what you're doing is you're miniaturizing your sensor. We all have a, a sort of negative inner critic. Mine is called Nigel. Uh, and Nigel is a gay British interior decorator. <laughs> uh, and I never have uh, been able to write well enough to please Nigel. Uh, and what happens is your critic will say to you as you're writing your morning pages, oh, this is boring. You don't want to yeah. talk about the weather. You don't want to talk about that. People aren't interested in that. Uh, and it keeps up a sort of chat of negativity. 
Uh, and what, because there's no wrong way to do morning pages, you learn to say, oh, Nigel, thank you for sharing. <laughs> and what you're doing is you're miniaturizing your critic. Uh, and instead of being the voice of doom, uh, it becomes uh, a sort of a wee peeping cartoon character like the negative relative who's always full of negativity at the picnic. Yeah. yeah. I went to see you live. Uh, you were doing an event in sort of like the San Jose area. I forgot the name of the retreat center, but it was beautiful. And I loved every moment of it, how you facilitate these experiences is so beautiful. And you had us very often get into like groups of three and talk to each other. And one of the things that you had us do, which was just so beautiful, is you have people give each other positive, what you call popcorn, like write on a piece of paper, something kind or something affirmative that you felt about this person and then crunk, crinkle up the paper and give this to the person. And it was the simplest thing, but what happened is people would weep because very often we're so hard on ourselves. This critic, this Nigel is so present that to have this theme running through your event where you like insisted, okay, now give each other that positive feedback. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like how lost is that where we don't do that for ourselves, where, where people are just walking around with such a heavy critic. And I so appreciate the, the amount of love that you are basically helping us learn to create for ourselves is that safe place to land. And it's beautiful. And I just want to say thank you for that. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, and I think that what happens is that pages dare us to expand. Uh, you're writing pages and you say, what should I do next? Uh, and something will come to you and you'll think, that's too big a risk. I can't do that. And you go back to writing your pages and a week later you ask, what am I supposed to do next? Uh, and they will say, well, you need to do X. And you'll say, that's still too big a risk. I can't do that. And then finally, the pages will sort of say, you must try X. Uh, and when they say that, you finally, just to shut them up, just to hush them, you, you say, Oh, all right, I'll try. Uh, and in the trying, you find yourself um, succeeding. Yeah. You so said I, think, I think my work is about baby steps. Uh, and the, as you take small steps, they add up to a large change. Yeah. Well, the first time you came on the show, I asked you why people maybe are not as creative. And you said, have you ever been in a preschool classroom? You said every kid in there is creative and messy, but somewhere along the way, when the kid turns seven or nine or 12, somebody rejects them and they stop flexing that muscle because they don't want to be rejected. And so, like I said, it's a you're really like teaching us to come back and be the parent to ourselves, be the, be the loving embrace to ourselves, to give ourselves the space to hear the thoughts that really are wanting to come in. So you talked about morning pages. What's another one of the tools that you talk about in this book that's in your toolbox? Well, I would say at the beginning of the book, Right for Life, I talk about three basic tools. I talk about, okay, do some morning pages. And then I say, and once a week, take yourself out and do something fun. Yeah. And it's called an artist state. Uh, and what we find uh, is that when we assign people work, I have a tool, it's a nightmare. You'll have to get up 45 minutes early. You'll have to write longhand. People say, work. Oh, I get it. I'm going to work on my creativity. But then when you say, now once a week, I want you to go do something festive, just for yourself, right. something that's fun, something that's lighthearted, something that your inner eight-year-old would enjoy. 
Uh, and um, what happens when people take artist dates is that they lighten up. Uh, they a lot of times feel a contact with what people call, some people call it the muse, some people call it the universe, some people call it the higher power, some people call it God. It doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is that you allow it to touch you. Uh, and um, that's so beautiful. We, uh, we've had, we've had Martha Beck on this show, I think three times. And she wrote this book called the joy diet, which is not about food. It's just about joy and how joy should be part of your every day. And she says, people write these letters to her and say, I cannot believe that you said, do more of the things you love and less of the things you don't. That's so big. She said, <laughs> it's just so funny to her how people forget to do things that make them happy. And um, it's so simple, but it's it's not simple because so often I look at my own week or a month or a year and say, oh my gosh, when was the last time that I arranged flowers? I love doing that. Or when was the last time I took a walk without my phone just to walk, right? And so- right. It's, which brings us to the third tool. Yeah, go ahead. Which is go ahead and take a walk. Go out without your phone. Go out without your friend. Go out without your dog. Uh, and just walk out for 20 minutes. Yep. Uh, and sort of stretch your mind and stretch your body. Uh, and again, what I find is that people come back and they have a sense of wonder. Uh, and they say, Julia, I think I fell in love with myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Uh, I feel like one of the, the things that comes up a lot for our listeners is a feeling of, I need something to happen to feel good. I need a goal to happen. I need this amount of money to happen. I need this person's love, I, whatever it is, but I need something outside of myself to feel good. And I think what I've gotten from doing work, reading your books and doing the exercises is that joy comes from within. It's, it's really not in the achieving of outside things. It's in that lightness in your own being. And we've kind of lost touch with how to even find it. So when you talk to people and they say, okay, I, I wrote, I got it. And now I want a bestseller or now I want you know, this many people to like it or this many people to review it. How do you help people find their way back to where joy really comes from? Because I, I don't think it's in the achievement. I think it's in what you just said, the wonder of falling in love with yourself, right? And that feels lost on us. We're, we're in such an achievement oriented culture. Well, and I think what we're missing here is humor. Uh, we become deadly serious we become convinced if I don't achieve, I'm not worth anything. Yeah. And so what I would say to people is, oh, well, I'll give you an example. I, I told you that I was worried about showing up wearing dark glasses. So I wrote a little poem that goes, this little poem goes out to my glasses work as a shield until this time passes. Here's to dark glasses to hide my eyelashes. I feel quite glam. In fact, I am. My writing's mysterious and makes folks delirious. Simple tools are the trick that makes a writer tick. So I share what I know and lead others. So life without makeup is a dare I will take up. I'll just wear my shades and masquerade as a competent teacher who isn't a preacher. I have stories to tell to avoid writer's hell. I love to write, blind or with sight. So I love it. I wrote that to just to break the ice and cheer me up. Uh, and what I find with people is when I say to them, Write a bad poem. <laughs> Write a bad poem. Uh, and if you do, uh, it'll make you happy. 
So yes. yeah, it's really, I love that. It made me laugh because it's just not something anyone ever says, you know, write about this, write about that. I, um, Seth Godin is a, like a mentor to me. And he said, you have to tell bad stories if you're going to allow the good ones to come through and you, you just tell a bad story, like start and give yourself something to edit. And, um, it's amazing the bar that we set for ourselves, which is, it's not in nature. I mean, it's not like there's any straight lines in nature, what we expect ourselves to just come up with a finished product rather than allowing a process and creativity is a process and the ego wants to have certainty and the ego wants to have no danger, no, no ability to uh, not be liked or not be ha having approval. So it wants perfect. And what you're saying is really a practice for the soul because we need to find the joy and the wonder and the humor. Well, I say to people, let yourself be just a little bit funny. And um, I sometimes tell them a story, which is that I wrote a crime novel uh, and the critic who reviewed it said, what is a new age guru doing writing a crime novel? scolding me uh, and I had had 19 good reviews so I was feeling kind of happy and a little bit puffed up and then the 20th review came out in the New York Times uh, and the the critic was very angry that my hero liked Carl Jung he was evidently a Freudian mm -hmm. so so the critic spent his whole column attacking Carl Jung instead of on the work I'd done. Uh, and so what happened was I got the review and I thought, oh, my God, I should go outside wearing sackcloth and ashes. I've been shamed in the New York Times. And then I thought, wait a minute, you have a weapon. Uh, and the man's name was Bill Kent. And so I wrote a little poem that goes, this poem goes out to Bill Kent, who must feel awful the way that he spent his life critiquing Carl Jung instead of on the work I'd done. Uh, and when I sort of skewered him a little bit, it cheered me up. And I, I strongly believe in humor. Yeah. And the tools that are in the right to write are tools like grab time. We have a mythology that says that writers need great vast amounts of time. Uh, and speaking for myself, I've never had that. So I've learned to grab time, which is to take maybe 20 minutes and just dash to the page. Wow. That's really cool. I heard that John Grisham was writing his first couple books like in the morning, an hour a day before he went to work as a lawyer. Like he didn't leave law until after like his third book was already a bestseller and he was just writing in little bits. But you're right. That is a thought people have. Like I would have to have a sabbatical. I would have to have a year to write something. And so I say, no, take 20 minutes. Yeah. All right. Write in the morning if you want to, but maybe write on your commuter ride home. And that's where Grisham was writing on his train, uh, riding home. Let me ask you this question because we have millions and millions of downloads of this podcast. And there might be people who are listening to the show thinking, oh, well, I'm not a writer. Uh, I do something else. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a this, I'm a that. My question to you is, do you think that this book, Write for Life, and writing in general would apply, would be helpful to anyone, regardless of if you ever have a, 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 an inkling of wanting to be a writer? Do you feel like there's, a, there's something that's in this experience that would provide for something for someone, even if you don't have a, a wanting to be a writer? Yes, I think so. Uh, and I think it has to do with dismantling perfectionism. Uh, and I think I'm a, I'm a writer. I love to write. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think of writing as being a primary creative tool. 
uh, and that people who write find themselves expanding in many different ways uh, and not necessarily as a focused writer, but maybe they put their house in order. Yeah, maybe. that's it's beautiful. You know, I've had a lot of people on this show who talk about their healing process and how not only did they overcome perfectionism, but they overcame shame. And I bring that up because at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned being sober. You mentioned that. And one thing that I find about friends of mine who've gone through a 12 step program is they, at least to me, what I perceive is a acceptance and a, a, a welcoming of all that is. And there's not a sense of shame. And I think a lot of people, the, their, their perfectionism comes with a feeling of shame about parts of themselves that they don't welcome to the table. And I think one of the healing aspects of being a part of your work, reading your books is learning to fully be a witness and also love who you are and have compassion for yourself and not have a sense of shame. And I was just curious what you think of, of that. And if people, if you see that people carry shame and maybe how they could set that down. Okay. This is where I sound like a fanatic. I say, okay, darling, I want you to try writing morning pages and remember that there's no wrong emotion. So you write your pages when you're feeling sad. You write your pages when you're feeling petty. You write your pages when you're feeling gr grumpy. Uh, and all parts of you are welcome here. Uh, and so I think that the morning pages are a profound exercise in self-acceptance. Uh, and we have many insights that come bubbling to the surface uh, where we say, oh, I didn't know I felt that way, and I do. And I think uh, I think it's very helpful to people to to do the exercises in Right for Life, which are exercises of dismantling perfectionism, grabbing time, laying track, lowering the bar. Uh, I think I have an expression, treating yourself like a precious object will make you strong. And I think we have a lot of mythology that says we have to flog ourselves forward and beat ourselves up. Uh, and I think instead we need to try coaxing ourselves, yeah. coaxing ourselves forward. You mentioned it earlier and you mentioned it as a theme in all of the books, at least the ones that I've read of yours. There's definitely a very clear connection between you and God. And I remember when I started this podcast, before I, before I did this podcast, I lived three years in Jerusalem and uh -huh. I, I was studying Kabbalah with a very holy Kabbalist in the old city. And then I came to Los Angeles and it took me a year on this podcast to openly talk about God because I was worried that people would get up and leave because there's a lot of conversation and there's a lot of uh, ways in which people burden that word or they don't know how to connect to it. And ultimately though, whenever I work with people and I think they say this in 12 step, I think that what's really there is like a God shaped hole. You know, we have all different kinds of words for God, but I wanted to thank you because your work gave me permission to say, no, I'm going to talk about this because this is really how I interact with the world as I have a spiritual practice. And I talk to, you know, this, I want this higher power to move through me. Right. I'm just curious. It's very, very bold in it's in bold color for me in your work. It's very much a, you and God are working together. Like I know that to be true. And so I'm just curious what you say, if people have a hard time feeling like they have a connection to God, or they're not sure, because a lot of people grew up as kids and felt like 
God was like Godzilla, like God was something that judged them or God was something that they felt scared of. And then they don't have a relationship to it. So maybe they say the universe or whatever they say, but for you, there's definitely a ongoing, beautiful relationship that's very powerful. And I think people are deeply in search of that, whether they know it or not. So what do you, what do you say to that? If somebody feels like they don't have that in their life right now, and they're not even sure, they're not even sure if they want it because their version of understanding of it doesn't feel like something that is a place of love. So again, I would say we want to coax people forward. So I have an exercise that's pretty simple, which is write down everything you were brought up to believe in God. And we find their perfectionism, authoritarian, judgmental, punishing, omnipresent, all powerful. Uh, and then I say, now take a separate column and write down everything you would like in a creativity God. So then they write down, oh, loves to cha-cha. <laughs> oh, loving, tender, merciful, understanding, passionate. And they make a list. And I say, okay, now I want you to write a letter to your higher power but to your new higher power uh, and lay your cards on the table uh, and tell the higher power what you need and what you want. Uh, and what happens is that people begin to think, oh, you mean I don't have to believe in God as told to me by the authorities? And I say, no, you don't. But I'd like to read a poem, please, which a lot of times, this, ad this addresses your issue of shame. I was not there when your mother bore you. Surely you came into this world hungering and wet. We all do that. Surely you came like the rest of us from that dark sea of souls, that sighing that brings us forth and calls us back. We all share that. If this is true, and it is, even for you, why are you a broken glass smashed against the floor? Why not the sea's grass on the ocean floor? Why not a smooth stone, a willow in the wind? Why do you break, not bend, and even broken, why not mend? You do know how. Walk with me to the edge of the city. Take off your shoes and feel the earth. It is softer than a woman. It is safer than your father. It is water. It is air. It is where you are returning with this yearning you can't can't name. Cast off your shame. It's an old coat. Remember who you are. You are a star, a mountain, that fountain in the sun. Your heart is the velvet cave where birds sing. Are you remembering? Mm. Beautiful. So poetry is my secret life. <laughs> so beautiful. When you started to read and you, you were a kid and you, then you got older, what were the books that turned you on? Like what were the first things you read that were written that you said, I love, I'm swooning over sentences. What were those first few or some of your favorites? Well, when I was a kid, I read horse stories. I read Black Beauty. Mm -hmm. I read The Black Stallion. I read The Island Stallion Races. Uh, and I really connected to them. 
and I used to go to the library uptown in Libertyville, Illinois, uh, and I would go up the stairs to the second floor, and they had a shelf that was all horse stories, and I would take home 14 books at a time uh, and read through them. So I have to say that the the books that I connected to first were were loving stories, Marguerite Henry, Misty of Shinkoti, Brighty of the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. um, I I just loved those. Mm. It's really, really, it's neat to hear that. Um, I can picture you as a kid reading those and that's a really sweet thought. I wanted to also ask you because I live in Los Angeles. I've been here for 20 years. Oh boy. I'm surrounded by creative people. And it seems as though there's something, um, there's something hard to put my finger on, but it's fascinating because I know I know more creative people here than anywhere. And there's a lot of suffering because there's almost a there's there's a need to be creative and a, and a yearning to be creative, but there's also a need for some kind of outside approval. And those two things together seem to be a really interesting combination. And I'm curious in your life, because you have lived through a lot of really interesting experiences, how we as people can maintain something that feels joyful and pure with our creativity without being caught up in something that starts to actually uh, cause suffering. If you know what I mean, there's a lot of that in the, um, the yearning for fame as it gets connected to somebody's creativity, whether it's songwriting or filmmaking. And I feel like that is kind of a disaster. <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm just curious what you think, because I, I know you've spent time here. What part of it is the the beautiful part and where do you think there's something in the culture here that maybe gets it off off course well one of the things that i say is fame is a spiritual drug that we can never be famous enough to suit ourselves so i think it's important and i talk about this in right for life to find what I call believing mirrors. And believing mirrors are people who applaud your efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, they're safe people. They're encouraging people. They're usually secretly happy people. <laughs> uh, and you share your work with them, and that's your inner circle. And there's safety there. And there's appreciation there. And you temporarily uh, unplug yourself from the culture. Yeah. And I think uh, it, it sounds like you have a yearning to express things uh, and a desire to help people. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important to have a desire to help yourself. It's so true. And your words are not just words. It's like when you speak, you're so enrolled in what you're saying that I think it's there's a resonance about you that's very powerful. It's like really, really healing to hear to hear you speak the the things that you say. It's really powerful. Today on my podcast, the, the episode that's airing is an episode with a woman named Nora Jones, who's a jazz pop uh -huh. artist. And she said to me that in 2000, I think it was 2002, she won these five Grammys. She was nominated for eight. She won five. She said that was the worst year of my life because she was doing it for the purposes of making music because she made, it made her feel really, really alive. Next thing she knew, it got all this attention. Next thing she knew, she won all these awards. She was only 23, winning all these awards. And then 
in the papers, people were saying how fantastic she was. And for every article that was saying how fantastic she was, there were people saying, why are people making such a big deal about her? She's not Ella Fitzgerald. She's not Billie Holiday. She's not Miles Davis. And she had never thought about herself at all, let alone why she was so great or why she's not that great. And next thing she knew, all these people had an opinion about her and the ones that were great it didn't feel worth the cost of all the other opinions that weren't great. She didn't want any of it. And then the following year, she couldn't keep up with that many Grammys. She couldn't, she couldn't get the next year to be the same result or the year after that. So she had to reinvent why she was making the music because the world was now saying, you should get this award. You should, get, and it's just fascinating. And that's what I'm speaking to is that there are people who are here or sometimes in New York City, there's like hubs, right? LA, New York, there's so many creative people and it starts out for its own sake. It starts out because it's beautiful, because there's a gift, because there's a yearning. So it's beautiful to hear your take on that because we forget to take care of ourselves, make it about other people. Okay, so can you see this? Yeah, the keyboard. It's a little teeny keyboard and it has alphabet on it yes a through <laughs> yep up, up to g uh, and what i found was that when i let myself play i could create music uh, and when i said to myself now you need to know how to play the piano properly I shut myself down. Yeah. So I would say to Nora, get one of those teeny little children's keyboards <laughs> and let yourself fool around. Uh, and I think uh, being lighthearted, uh, again, uh, is the antidote for the fame drug. Yeah. It's so beautiful. I want to ask you, you, you are so unrelenting in how you show up for people in the work you do. You have constantly fought for people to love themselves more, to give themselves a break. And I wonder what lights that fire in you to keep doing that, why you see that so clearly as something that you feel called to do? Well, I think I feel called to make art. Uh, and that the tools that I teach are tools from experience. You know, I found out that being funny helped. I found out that grabbing time helped. I found out that dismantling perfectionism helped. Uh, and again, I come from a big family. Uh, and I, I think we were raised to help each other. So I think uh, that what happens for me uh, is that I don't want the mantle of St. Julia. I, I want to say, you can all do this. You all have the power within you to succeed. You all have a light heart if you let yourself have a light heart. Yeah. Like watching you, uh, when I say something funny, you light up. Yeah, well, you're very funny, yeah. And I find it, I just love meeting someone who has had such a serious, in terms of the the, the gravity of your impact is serious in a, in a way, because it's big, and yet you don't take yourself very seriously. So I just find that very, refreshing and beautiful. In the book, you also not only talk about practical tools, tools to start projects, but you also talk about finishing projects. And I wanted to ask you about that before we end, because very often people don't begin, but if they do begin, they usually don't finish it. There's something fascinating about how many unfinished projects there are about how many people have some germination of something and they didn't finish it. Why do you think people don't finish what they start and how do you think they can? 
Well, my experience is that people start a project sort of lit up and happy mm -hmm. and they go along writing. And then when they're maybe two thirds of the way through the project, they hit the wall. Yeah. And the wall is doubt. Oh. And the wall says, maybe it isn't such a good idea. Maybe you're not a good enough writer. Maybe you shouldn't have tried this. Uh, and typically what we do when we hit the wall is we try and scale the wall. And if you think of the old convict movies, yeah, we realize that scaling the wall puts you in the spotlight and you get shot. Yeah, right. <laughs> but if you're willing to burrow under the wall and say, I'm willing to finish this work, even if it's terrible. Mm. I'm willing to write badly. Uh, and when we become willing to finish something badly, we often have the freedom to finish something well. There's something that I call laying track, which is just putting a certain daily quota on the page. Uh, and if you use the tools, you'll be able to keep going. You won't get stalled. Uh, and if you hit the wall, you learn to burrow under it with humility. Yeah. And I think uh, it takes humility to finish a project. Yeah. And that humility often is rewarded by a sense of relief. Oh my God, I did it. Yeah. And uh, my my um my thought right now is I'm I'm in the process of writing my second book for Simon and Schuster. I don't enjoy the process. I have a ton of reasons why I need to keep going back to your work because I it is the most humbling experience of my life writing a book. I find it very triggering. So it's I'm I'm definitely your uh target reader. Like I'm the person, I'm one of the people I think you you write for because at least some of these books, they really, really help me. But the reason I was going to ask this next question is because, so I'm writing a, a book that's about self-development, self-discovery, right? It's based on the work that I do. Anyway, I look out there at what's already been written, right? From Wayne Dyer, Eckhart Tolle, Brene Brown, Martha Beck, like there's so many books, right? And then I sit here and I think, what the hell is so different about any new book being introduced, right? And I'm just wondering, at the end of the day, why, <laughs> when somebody's writing something, are they writing it if, in fact, on some level, everything's already been said? It's like, what is unique? What's really unique? Or what is it that people read books to know? Because on some level, everything's been written. So I'm just curious what you think is the um, purpose for someone else to write and basically say a version of what somebody else has already said, because the Beatles have said it, Shakespeare has said it. It's lots of things have already been said. So I'm just curious when you're going to write a book and there's thousands of other books, what makes it vital or purposeful or unique for you to write a book? So you think you're asking the wrong questions. Good. What do you think about what I'm saying? Well, what you're talking about is the spirit of competition where you're looking at other people's work and saying they've said it so well. Yes, they have. They've done a great job. They've yeah. done a great job. Everything's been said. Uh, and what we don't realize is that we are the origin of our work. And so the question to ask is, am I being honest? Am I being vulnerable? Am I being authentic? Uh, and there's a whole essay in the book ab about this. Uh, and it talks about the need to say what I want to say. Uh, and there are exercises in the Right for Life that say, what I'd really like to write about is, what I'd really like to write about is, 
what I'd really like to say is, what I'd really like to say is, uh, and what you're doing, uh, well, I, I, I published The Artist's Way in 1992. And in 2020, I came on a book that had been written in 1934 that talked about morning writing and talked about taking festive dates. Uh, and I found myself, instead of feeling competitive with the writer, I felt a sense of camaraderie. Oh, we saw some of the same things. So when you dismantle your competition and you realize that you are the origin of your work and that what you have to say has validity, then you stop worrying so much about the other greats that have said it better. It's so powerful what you just said. And it, uh, it really reminds me to put my own, my story in the work, my own, because that's something that's unique to me. And I love that exercise in the book. What would I write if I, what do I really want to say? What do I really want to write? I think that, uh, that's such a powerful question, such a powerful question. Thank you for that. So um, it was such an incredible treat to sit with you. It's like going to church. It's, it's like a holy experience. And um, I thank you for that. I want you to tell everybody, is there any way that they can connect with any like do you have anything running right now, like any online community or any courses digitally or any retreats that you're doing? Is there any way anyone can not only buy your books, but connect to you right now? Do you have anything like that going on? Well, it all sounded terrible. It sounded very hard. Uh, and right now what I've been doing is writing a little music. Uh, and feeling happy about that uh, and I have a website that has all sorts of things that I've written and done on it it's called juliacameronlive.com okay and uh, it announces things but what I don't want uh, I think the reason I write books uh, is that people can buy them and use them at their own pace yeah uh, and it it just sounds like uh, I don't. I don't want to be Saint Julia. Yeah, I heard you say something so powerful and humble, so humble. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, just based on other things I heard other people say. Somebody stood up at the retreat I was at with you and said, "Do you get upset when other people create uh, groups around the artist way?" And you said, "No." <laughs> That's great. And I thought that is so pure and beautiful. And um, one thing that I think our listeners can remember, which I think is so incredibly powerful, is that so many of your books are broken into six weeks or 12 weeks. And every time, every time I've read any of your books, I usually gather six or seven friends. We all buy it. We all buy the book. And then we do it together. And then we meet up once a week and we talk about our artist date or we talk about what came through the pages and it is the most powerful experience. So I would recommend, we'll put links to your newest book and we'll, we'll put the link to your website, but I would recommend that anybody who's listening, you buy the book and tell six of your friends to buy it and do it as a group study because it is so, you, you make it so easy to do it that way. Well, that's wonderful. It's the it's some of the funnest, deepest conversations I've ever had have been inside those rooms of people I've put together to read through your book. And we've done it many times. It's like we, as a group of my friends, my 10 closest girlfriends, we have gone through the artist way and write for life more than once over and over again. And it is just the best. And every time 
15 new things get discovered. Well, that's a wonderful thing. And I think it's talking about what you're needing to do is some self-empowerment. You know, uh, I think we make, we make different things our God uh, and we make it like uh, Simon and Schuster is the power. And actually it's you and your higher power that are the power. And if Simon and Schuster doesn't like your book, somebody else will. So you need to have the freedom back of creating uh, and you need to tell your own story and you need to not worry about other people having done it before you. Uh, because one of the things we find about reading is that sometimes uh, it's the familiar that moves us. It's the well-told tale that's been told before that moves us. So this business of striving to be original and say something different uh, is self-defeating. You are um, even more intuitive than I think you are. And I already thought you were very, very, very intuitive. But the fact that you have zeroed in on my personal um, rite of passage just by listening to several sentences it's very it's also very generous and I appreciate you so much and I I definitely take I will take that to heart I, I feel really changed by this conversation so thank you so so much for being so present everywhere you go you've done thousands of these kinds of talks and interviews and you're so present every time it's very generous. I really appreciate so much. Well, I'll be happy when you're writing again. <laughs> I've literally taken a year and a half and like written a bunch, sent it in, chucked it all. So right now there's two chapters and it's just like the amount of thought that keeps spinning. It's amazing the overthinking that we do. Yes. I have a very good friend who's a good poet, but stops to rewrite everything yeah. and kills the spontaneity. Yeah, He's an overthinker. So I think what I'm trying to do is trick you mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. not overthinking. So I think it'd be good for you to write a little poem about the process you've been through and just say, I've been trying to write a book, but find myself caught on a hook. <laughs> yep. I try to be more creative, but I don't feel that I'm a native. <laughs> That's good. You know, just let yourself play again. Yeah, it's so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will put the links for our listeners to write for life. We'll put the link to your website. And I'm so glad that since the last time you were here, we got you on zoom so that we could um, have she you here. My classes. Yeah. It's no, I really thought it was just the coolest hippest choice that you were making, but thank you for all of the laughter, the wisdom and the love. Well, you're very welcome. And I want to close by reading a poem that might resonate for you. Uh, we tend to believe that poetry is created out of pain. Uh, and I have found that poetry can be created out of bliss, out of funniness, out of happiness. <laughs> so um, this little poem uh, was written when I was falling in love. Okay. It's called Jerusalem is Walking in This World. This is a great happiness. The air is silk. There is milk in the looks that comes from strangers. I could not be happier if I were bread and you could eat me. 
Joy is dangerous. It fills me with secrets. Yes, kisses in my veins. The pains I take to hide myself are sheer as glass. Surely this will pass. The wind, like kisses. The music in the soup. The group of trees laughing as I say their names. It is all Hosanna. It is all prayer. Jerusalem is walking in this world. Jerusalem is walking in this world. It's so beautiful. And having walked in Jerusalem so many times, I particularly love that because it's a visceral, memorized place that I remember. I remember that frequency so well, and your poem is beautiful, but thank you. You want to hear another poem? You want to read us one more? Sure. I don't want to take so much of your time, but please, please, please read it. This is a poem about a spiritual awakening. I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> I can't pronounce this bliss. The way we flow, the knowing where to go. This ebb and flow, can't we take it slow? Where are the walls, the shadows in the halls? This light, can it be right? Where does it come from? I've known a different sun, walked a different earth where air was used for grieving. I think I'm leaving. Before we met, I knew your face from stars and stones. I knew your name from wind and grasses. Before we met, the red earth held my heart. The sky cradled my dreams. The forest floor was my green bed. These were what I wed before we met. Now that you are here, I'm wed to galaxies. Mm. Our sky does not contain me. Our sun is a candle to what I see. Sheer as a cliff, the walls drop away. I love that. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Thank you for just pouring all this confetti and hearts of sweetness all over us. It's such a treat. You know, I feel like everything everybody wants is just the experience of love and you you show up with bundles of love to give away. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm such an appreciative recipient recipient of it. So we will put this out and I'm sure people will be so happy that they got to hear this. So thank you so much for making the time even after you had surgery and I'm sure it wasn't your first choice but it was wonderful. So thank you. You're welcome. Lots of love. Thank you. Thank you, Julia.